so uh, I see a lot of uh, people on the screen now. Um, time is 5.02, so we will be starting this webinar right away. Good evening to you all, good kväll till er i Sverige, and uh, good morning to Professor Browning, uh, who uh, uh, is in a different time zone. Um, I would wish, uh, uh, I would like to wish you all Recording a very in progress. Warm, uh, welcome to this webinar, 30 years after ordinary men, what have we learned from the Holocaust? Uh, and of course, uh, a very special welcome to our professor, um, our guest, Professor Browning. Professor Browning is one of the world's most renowned Holocaust scholars, as I, I think all of you will know. Uh, my name is Petra Marcellius, and I'm the Director General uh, of the Living History Forum. The Living History Forum is a Swedish government agency tasked with uh, promoting democracy. Uh, and human rights. And we do this based on lessons learned from the Holocaust. We work um, a lot through education of teachers and pupils and also civil servants. We work with exhibitions, with uh, Holocaust memorial uh, study visits, uh, etc. So it's a, a very broad range of activities we do. And one of our important tasks that we have been given from the Swedish government is to uh, organize events and on Holocaust Memorial Day. And this webinar is uh, one of our important events now um, in light of Holocaust Memorial Day tomorrow, the 27th of January. Uh, there's a lot of interest uh, in this topic in Sweden, and we are we are seeing that around um, from the very north of Sweden to the very south, there are around 200 different activities, seminars, um, candle lightings, etc., uh, commemorating Holocaust Memorial Day tomorrow. So it's uh, um, a strong engagement in the issue. And we can see it here also on the screen that we have so many participants tonight. So with that, um, I'm looking very much forward to um, listening to this uh, important discussion. Uh, and I would like to leave the floor uh, to my colleague, Caroline Schell, uh, who will be introducing Professor Browning and the seminar. Thank you very much and welcome. So, uh, my name is Caroline Schellner and I'm the head of education and research here at the Living History Forum. And I'm going to introduce uh, our distinguished guest, Christopher Robert Browning, an American hist historian. Uh, Browning received his doctorate from the University of Wisconsin-Madison in 1975 and he's, he taught at Pacific Lutheran University from 1974 to 1999, eventually becoming a distinguished professor. In 1999, he moved to University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill to accept an appointment as Frank Porter Graham Professor of History. His research focuses on the Nazi Germany and the Holocaust. He has written extensively about three issues. First, Nazi decision and policy making in regard to the origins of the final solution. Second, the behavior and motives of various middle and lower level personnel uh, involved in implementing Nazi Jewish policy. And thirdly, the use of survivor testimony to explore Jewish responses and survival strategies. Professor Browning has received a number of honors and awards, including the Yad Vashem Book Prize in 2012 re for remembering survival, two honorary doctorates, and twice the National Jewish Book Award in the Holocaust category, and much more. So we are very glad and honored to have you here, uh, Professor Browning. Uh, this afternoon and the evening here in Sweden. Um, but it's early in the morning, right, where you are at the moment. 
Yes, we're first uh, eight o'clock in the morning here on the west coast of the United States. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, for the audience, I would like to uh, to say that it's great if you want to ask question, you can write your question in the chat. Um, so we can bring some of, of the question up later in the in the webinar. Uh, well, in this uh, seminar, we are going to take a starting point in, in one of your most well-known books, uh, Ordinary Men, that was first published in 1992. So my first question to, to you, Professor Browning, is how did it come about that you, you started the work with this, uh, with this book? Well, uh, starting in my with my doctorate on the Jewish experts of the German Foreign Office in the 1970s and through the 80s, I was looking at mid-level uh, German functionaries. Uh, and there uh, one could work with the documents that they left behind because they, of course, were bureaucrats producing reports, memoranda, telegrams, letters. Uh, and uh, you could write a history of their activities based upon their own contemporary records. Uh, the low-level participants in the Holocaust, people I would call the grassroots killers, the ones that actually pulled the trigger or ran the camps, uh, were not the kind of people that had to write. Uh, and so they didn't leave reports, they didn't leave diaries, they didn't leave letters. And so they were, in a sense, a, a kind of faceless aspect of the Holocaust other than uh, the most notorious ones that could be described by survivors uh, because they were the most memorable ones. Uh, so I was always on the lookout for a way to get access to or entry into them as a group. And that happened in the late 1980s when I was working at the Central Agency for the Investigation of Nazi Crimes in Germany and came across the trial records of Reserve Police Battalion 101. Uh, and I immediately saw uh, that I uh, had a chance now uh, to, uh, to get access to the uh, re the, the oral, in a sense, accounts of these people uh, given in a trial preparation investigation in the 1960s in Hamburg. And what made it especially crucial is that the roster of the battalion survived. And so in preparing the trial, they could interview 210 policemen out of a unit of about 500. Most of these were uh, basically rank and file people. Previous trials of police battalions, they knew the officers, but they didn't know the men. And the officers lied for one another, covered for one another, uh, and you couldn't break through uh, this kind of conspiracy of denial uh, to get real accounts of what had happened in the battalion. But in this case, with these uh, just 210 testimonies and a very able group of investigators, I had 30 volumes of testimony from which I could now really recreate uh, the inner life, the inner dynamics of a killing unit, uh, which we had not been able to do before. So I recognize that we had a source now that finally unlocked uh, uh, the answer to, a, to questions that we had had but had not been able to answer up until that time. And that is, uh, what about, not the, the notorious sadists, but what about the ordinary people in these killing units? Uh, how did they get there? What choices did they have? How did they react to what they were doing? Uh, how were they changed by what they were doing? Uh, and so uh, the once I had found these materials, I knew that I had the basis for, for an important case study that would have much wider ramifications than simply the history of this single battalion. Mm -hmm. uh, can one say, uh, because you have, you have been um, working with this, uh, this material, can, can one say that the men studied in your book were typical uh, or not for 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 the battalions that were working in uh, at I'm this sorry, time. I didn't quite understand the question. Uh, can say? Can you say that the men studied in your book were typical for for these kind of uh, per, uh, staff working in in battalions at the at the time or? Yeah, well, certainly they were different than the carefully selected and recruited Einsatzgruppen. We knew a lot about the Einsatzgruppen because they had left these detailed reports that they sent to Berlin every day and resulted in these monthly summaries. Uh, and of course, were one of the Nuremberg trials was devoted to the Einsatzgruppen. Uh, but they were only 3,000 men. Uh, they did not 
kill a million and a half Soviet Jews. Uh, they killed part of them, but there were many other units about which we knew very little. And what my work helped to begin was the study of a whole series of order police battalions and reserve order police battalions that were an essential source of manpower uh, for these huge ongoing massacres in the Soviet occupied territories that over two years uh, basically uh, murdered all of the Soviet Jews that the Germans uh, could lay their hands on. Now, once we began to study all of the different battalions, one could answer the question that you posed. I couldn't answer that question when I first began researching this unit because it was the first reserve, first police battalion studied in detail. Since then, many have been, and the answer is, no, it is not a typical killing unit, but nonetheless, it is a absolutely vital uh, unit for understanding aspects of the Holocaust. And let me explain that. Uh, the, the Einsatzgruppen, as I say, were very carefully recruited. So their, their officers are elite SS, people sent to the East to prove themselves, uh, and uh, that uh, they were trained and specially selected. The order police uh, were formed in three groups. There are three types of order police battalions. The first were uh, reserve battalions that were created out of non-professional police, reserve policemen that would have weekend and summer training between 1937 and 1939 that were then mobilized into battalion-sized units in 1939, uh, trained and indoctrinated further, and then sent into occupied territories like Poland uh, to be the behind the lines police enforcers of the German occupation. A second, and they were basically men in their late 20s and early 30s. Uh, as I say, they had other jobs until the war and then they became uh, policemen by mobilization. A second group were younger men uh, uh, who had volunteered basically for uh, the army uh, and uh, that were made available to the police uh, in an agreement between the army and the police. And they had much higher percentages. This is the younger group. So they had higher percentages of, of Nazi party membership. Uh, and they too received considerable indoctrination and training, were sent off to occupied territories to learn how to, in a sense, enforce a racial empire on behalf of the Nazis. Uh, and uh, that when they were sent to Russia, uh, they, they, they have had a long experience uh, of brutal occupation behind them. Reserve Police Battalion 101 is the last kind of group, and that is uh, units that are reformed uh, in 1942, made up of a new group of conscripts. In 1941-42, the Germans raised the age of people who uh, have to do compulsory military service, but the army considers them too old. Uh, so these men between 35 and 45, the average age of the battalion was 39 and a half years old, are conscripted into the police battalion. Uh, there's very little time for indoctrination, very little time for training. Uh, they aren't particularly uh, of a Nazi, uh, you know, a higher percentage of Nazi membership. Uh, they are too young to have served in World War I. They are too old to have been raised in Hitler youth, Hitler schools. Uh, they're in that limbo generation in between, raised in the Weimar Republic. So they know political standards that are pre-Nazi. They are not raised in the Nazi bubble. And these people then are sent to Poland with no preparation for what's going to happen. Uh, and the key thing is these people who, in this case, coming from Hamburg, a relatively unnazified city, from an age group that falls in, in between, not particularly Nazified, from most of them from working class background. And of course, the working class was less susceptible to Nazi appeal than socialists and the communist parties lost fewer people to the Nazis than any other political parties. If you were choosing a group of people least likely to become killers on behalf of the Nazi regime, it would be the kind of men in Reserve Police Battalion 101. And the key lesson is, nonetheless, this becomes one of the most lethal killing units under Nazi German occupation. So uh, even if it's not a typical unit, the lesson is quite frightening, and that is even people who are least likely to become killers can be turned into killers. Ordinary men can become full-time killers and members of a killing unit. Uh, and in the end, this was the fourth most lethal reserve police battalion in Germany, even though it starts a year later. Most of these units went into Russia in the summer of 41, 
A reserve Police Battalion 101 doesn't begin its killing until the summer of 42. And by the end of the war, it has a body count, the fourth highest of any police battalion uh, under the Nazis. Uh, and so while it's not typical, it is nonetheless a very frightening lesson about the capacity uh, of a regime uh, to create and recruit people who are transformed into killers, even if it seems unlikely that they would have been. Yes, you, you have studied uh, the post-war judicial inter interrogations of members of, of this battalion. And of course, we often think that it's difficult to understand how the Holocaust could, could have happened. And it, it's even more difficult to understand when you describe this group of, of, of men in, in this uh, battalion. How, how did it uh, go about? How did it happen? What was your main conclusions when you studied this group? How did this um, transformation uh, come about? Yes, I mean, one thing I was very interested in the sense was the dynamics of transformation. Uh, what happened when they were sent to kill? Uh, and the first massacre, in fact, was quite traumatic uh, for the men. Uh, they hadn't been prepared for this. This came as a big surprise. Uh, and many of them were, were quite shocked, quite traumatized, had nightmares uh, and that sort of thing. But uh, again, the frightening lesson is how quickly they became habituated to what they were doing, how quickly they got used to being uh, killers, even though uh, they hadn't been prepared in any real way through indoctrination and training for this. But uh, as, they be, as they went through the killing process, particularly the summer fall of 42, where they are both carrying out local massacres far from any train station where they could deport Jews to Treblinka or in the larger towns where they round up Jews, stick, stick them, stuff them into train cars and send them to Treblinka, which is only about you know, 60 or 70 miles to the north. Uh, what happens is that the unit, in a sense, breaks into three rough, roughly three groups. Uh, one group, uh, a, a minority, but the most important minority, are, are people I call the eager killers, people who learned to enjoy killing other human beings and sought the opportunity to kill more. Uh, they go out and they shoot, they come home and have a lunch, and they joke and laugh about what they have done and boast about it to their comrades. Uh, a second group are what I would call the accommodators or the compliers. Uh, they do what they are told, and if they're assigned to a firing squad, they do it, but they don't seek opportunity to kill. Uh, they don't enjoy killing, they don't want to, but they will, won't uh, refuse or try to evade. And the third group are the evaders, the ones that take an effort not to be part of the killing, direct killing process, not to be trigger pullers. They still will perform other duties, uh, such as the cordons around executions or the roundups in the ghettos that will put people on trains, but the direct act of killing is the sense which they manage to evade. And they can do that uh, because the major of the battalion basically made it the policy of the battalion that nobody was to be forced to shoot. From the very first day, he gave the option to the men that those that, quote, didn't feel up to it could step out and excuse them from being assigned to firing squads. Uh, so no one in this battalion is forced to be a trigger for. They still participate in other ways, uh, but they don't have to directly kill defenseless women and children and elderly uh, if they choose not to. So of course, one of the things that was most fascinating to me when I saw the first you know, testimonies about this battalion was that here I had a case where the standard alibi of post-war accused, I was forced to do it, I acted under duress, I was coerced, uh, does not hold. Uh, and that clearly here was the case where they now had to explain in other ways uh, what they had done and why they had done it. So the testimonies, uh, as I say, 30 volumes of testimonies that can't base itself on the, oh, I was forced to do it, I had no choice. So that made it an extraordinarily rich source in addition to the number of men, 40% of the battalion being interrogated, also being deprived of and not being able to rely upon the standard alibi that was put forth in virtually every other trial. Uh, so 
so when you um, you came out with this book, Ordinary Men, the the research you have had done was uh, kind of new and it had a, a huge impact. How 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 did you think the book were received at at the time when it uh, came out in 1990s? Well, first of all, we have to remember that Holocaust studies is still was still in its developing stages. Uh, and that the focus up until that point had been on Hitler, his ideology, the decision making of the top ranks of the Nazi party. And insofar as they looked at lower ranks, they were looking at concentration camp guards uh, and uh, death camp personnel. Uh, these roving killing squads, uh, other than the Einsatzgruppen, had not been on, uh, on, in a sense, as part of our consciousness of being a key element of the Holocaust. Uh, the result was, uh, when I wrote the manuscript, it was submitted to three publishers that did not accept the book. It was the fourth publisher that uh, that agreed to publish the book. Uh, and when it came out, uh, yeah, people did realize, certainly colleagues in the profession, but also more broadly, uh, that this was something new. This, this gave us access to a new avenue of approaching the Holocaust, new set of insights. It stirred a lot of new scholarship, which of course is what all historians writing hope to do, that you raise new questions. You're not just answering questions, you're raising new questions. So it, it was a, a spur to a new side of perpetrator studies into the low level killers, into the what I call the, the ordinary men. Uh, there was generally well received, but there were criticisms. Uh, and uh, some of them I think were, were not particularly uh, meritous. But there were a number of responses that were part of the process of moving further, of that is expanding what we knew, raising important questions, uh, and helping to uh, further scholarship. So uh, the, I think one of the most important things in the book is that it triggered a whole set of discussions that have advanced our knowledge, uh, particularly in the 1990s, new research on the police battalions, and also coming at the perpetrators with new questions. Um, I'd be happy to discuss some of those if you wish. <laughs> yes, please. Uh, um, could you describe some of the new research that have uh, come after the book was released in this field? Yeah, well, certainly one of the areas uh, where the book was criticized uh, was that it was seen as uh, neglecting the importance of anti-Semitism as a motive. It was dealing with these men as non-ideological killers. And so even though I argued in the book itself that you needed a multi-causal explanation, and I certainly did talk about anti-Semitism, I just didn't make it central. Uh, nonetheless, the criticism that came, uh, particularly from Daniel Goldhagen's book, Hitler's Willing Executioners, basically posited that anti-Semitism was the sole sufficient and necessary explanation, and you didn't need anything else. And so when his book took that position, my book was put into the position of being the, the, the binary opposition. Mine was, no, it doesn't require anti-Semitism. Yes, it's only anti-Semitism, which is a false binary. Uh, and what came out of the discussion in the 90s, in particular a contribution, the best articulation, was by a social psychologist, Leonard Newman, who pointed out that the ideological, cultural, explanation and the situational, social, psychological, organizational, institutional explanation are not opposites, but are inextricably combined. Because a person in a situation, and my, my interpretation was called the situational interpretation. Uh, these men in this situation responded in these ways. But situations are different for different people, depending upon the cultural expectations they bring with them. That as they come to a situation, they interpret, read, understand that situation through the cultural glasses that they are wearing. So that Germans in Poland in a reserve police battalion would operate different than, say, Italians. And we know Italians in occupation zones behave very differently. Uh, so there is automatically a cultural, cultural, uh, ideological side even if you were talking about how the unique situation of these men in Poland shaped how they responded at that moment out of the internal dynamics of the battalion in which I emphasize social psychological factors. 
Uh, and so what came out of this was one, it was a better understanding that we had to include both of these, that these men are reacting to the situation they're in. You cannot explain what they're doing without looking at the dynamics of group behavior. They didn't do this as individuals. None of these men on his own would have shot Jews in Hamburg. They did it in a group setting in an occupied territory where peer pressure, role expectation, uh, deference to authority are all magnified and shape how groups behave. And we know this from various social psychological experiments. But they're also shaped by uh, their views of German racial superiority, of Jews being outside of the German community of moral obligation, being enemies, accepting the regime's definition of the situation that Germany is at war with the Jews and Jews are enemies. Uh, and so you really need both of those if you're going to explain how these men reacted and why they reacted as they did. Uh, so uh, that insistence that we, that we expand those, that led on further in the, in the early uh, 21st century to saying, if we're looking at culture, we must look at it much more broadly. And we can't focus solely on anti-Semitism. That we must look at the broader aspects of German culture that were also important in the capacity of the regime to mobilize these people to kill. And there, the work of Thomas Kuna, who talks about comradeship and the resonance that the notion of Volksgemeinschaft, the racial community, had for Germans, was essential in explaining why these people would respond as a group and do what they did, not particularly because they liked what they were doing, uh, but not feeling that what they were doing was immoral or criminal. Uh, and uh, so this wider cultural matrix, in a sense, in which these men find themselves, not just anti-Semitism, but a broader racism, and not just racism, but a broader sense of German community, German superiority, uh, and German entitlement, uh, were all part of what is essential to, to factor in if we're going to understand why a group of middle-aged Germans drafted off the streets of Hamburg can become the fourth most effective killing unit in the order police. Mm. Uh, uh, connecting to what you are saying, uh, when in, in the beginning of your, or your book you have a lot of uh, quotes and refer to different reports from the um, from lieutenants and, and more high rank uh, people reporting to the headquarters. And when you read this, you see that um, uh, the mass murder is kind of a normalized thing it's it's uh, like an everyday thing they are writing about how can how can you understand that this uh, it's it's like this it's happening in in this way uh well i, th I think as an historical case study it's important because it does show the power of habituation how, what people can become used to and how quickly norms of behavior can be altered by what we see and what we're doing. These men are changed by what they do. Uh, and the speed with which that takes place is in a sense, one of the most surprising things to me uh, when I was going through the material, how men who are traumatized by killing in July are doing it as a total matter of routine uh, by the fall. Uh, and that uh, this transformation into indifferent killers, uh, into numbed killers, takes place uh, in a relatively short period of time. Uh, and uh, that I had uh, simply, nothing had prepared me quite uh, for that. Uh, and uh, that I think is confirmed by some other kinds of sources we've later found. There is an important collection of letters that we later recovered, published in Germany in 1999, from uh, a company cameraman in the third company of Reserve Police Battalion 105 from Bremen. So it's a company from the same part of Germany with the same kind of makeup, very much similar to 101, uh, sent to the Baltic, sent to Lithuania in the opening days of the war. And you can trace from his first letters to his wife in July to the fall, the extraordinary degeneration that takes place. Uh, in, in early July, uh, he says, if Jews have no food, I don't know how they live. I can't be so tough. We share our rations with them. In August, he's saying here, you know, all the Jews, men, women, and children are being shot. 
And then he says to my, please don't talk to, about, to our kids about this. There's still a bit of a shame or desire this not be made known in the family what he's involved in. Uh, then later he's saying to his wife, uh, we had some executions. I wasn't there. I missed it. I didn't get pictures. It was said to have been fun. And finally, in the last execution, well, I got the execution pictures today. They will be a great souvenir for our children. And all of that takes place over about three or four months. Uh, so you can see in his own words, written at the time, this extraordinary degeneration uh, that takes place, how uh, he normalizes what they're doing in such a rapid period of time. Uh, of course, you get a bit uh, um, sad about the, the human being behavior when you hear about this. Uh, was it because you have been studying so much material? Have you ever have problems with your own feelings uh, when you have been working with these materials? You know, it's it's hor horrific material. Uh, well, of course, I've been working in Holocaust materials for you know, many decades now, uh, but there are always some things that still have the power to shock. And so uh, occasionally, and certainly the afternoon that I read the, the indictment of this police battalion, uh, it was just so disturbing, I had to leave the archive. Uh, I just quit for the day and went left and, and came back the next morning because it was just too important not to look at. But mm -hmm. yes, this still had the, even though I saw this about nearly two decades into my career, uh, it still had the period, the, the capacity to absolutely stun me. Even though I had worked through many court records, uh, it still was uh, it was just, particularly the, the part where it was clear these men all had choice. When I read about the, the speech of the major offering the option not to take part and knowing what this battalion had done, uh, I just had to leave the archive. In the in the 1970s, you also looked at uh, bureaucrats involved in the Holocaust. Mm -hmm. Can you say anything? Are there any differences between these groups of uh, uh, servants, the policemen and, and uh, the bureaucrats? Yes, for the bureaucrats, of course, they have a much more what I would call sanitized connection. They don't see the people who are harmed by their acts. Uh, they don't shoot Jews, they don't strike Jews, they don't beat Jews. Uh, they write telegrams that basically set in motion somebody else deporting Jews and killing Jews. Uh, so they don't see the impact of what they are doing. They're not the face-to-face -face killers like the men that I was studying in 101 are. Uh, nonetheless, uh, they certainly uh, have the capacity uh, to understand uh, what they are participating in. Uh, and some of them, in fact, try to get out uh, and get reassigned, but others, in fact, uh, are proud and, and ambitious about what they're doing. Uh, a prime example, for instance, would be the, uh, the head of the Jewish desk of the German Foreign Office, a man named Franz Rademacher. Uh, he is, uh, when the war starts, he, in fact, is the cultural attache in Montevideo, Uruguay. Uh, he's sent home from South America in the spring of 1940. Uh, the job that he's given is offered as the head of the Jewish desk in the German Foreign Office. Well, he's been a Nazi Party member uh, for a long time, uh, but hasn't been involved in anti-Semitic activities. His response is one, to accept the job, and two, immediately to write every publisher in Germany asking for anti-Semitic books, to turn himself into a self-made anti anti self anti-Semite, to train himself to be an anti-Semite. Uh, and he's so proud when he gets a letter from the foreign editor of Der Sturmer, uh, you know, this notorious anti-Semitic, uh, the international editor of Der Sturmer, this notorious anti-Semitic magazine uh, that Julius Stryker edited out of Nuremberg, uh, telling Rademacher that he considers him a great Kenner, a, a, a great uh, expert on the Jewish question, that he has now arrived in the estimation of other noted anti-Semites as being a fellow anti-Semitic expert. So here's somebody uh, who didn't come to the job because he was a professional anti-Semite. He makes himself into a professional anti-Semite because that's the job open and he wants to be the best anti-Semite he can be. So ambition, careerism, 
uh, clearly is a very important factor for these mid-level bureaucrats uh, who want to climb, uh, who want to move up, and who want to get a sense of self-importance, uh, and who are eager to take initiatives. These are not people simply being told what to do. Once he's in this job, one of the first things he does is submit a plan uh, for shipping all the Jews to Madagascar. Now, this is something that very quickly Hitler adopts, but the initiative for this came from somebody fairly low down in the, in the, uh, in the bureaucracy, uh, not because somebody was assigning it to them or forcing them, but he's looking for ways to be important. He's looking for ways to leave his mark. He's looking for ways uh, to, to uh, en en enhance his career and to establish his bona fides as a player uh, in the persecution of the Jews. Uh, so in that sense, I think you have more bureaucratic striving, more careerism in the bureaucrats than you do among the rank and file face-to-face -face killers. Uh, and you also have the sanitized distance, but they are both performing essential aspects of the job, uh, that you really needed both the ideological and policy leadership from the top, you needed the striving bureaucratic problem solvers in the middle, and you needed the trigger pullers at the bottom. Uh, and all of those perform essential aspects of which is a, what is a multitask operation. So if you should uh, describe for us, why do you think it's so important to understand uh, how the perpetrators were acting, thinking and transforming on a deeper level? Why, why is it important for us to study this and learn about this? Well, genocide and mass killing, unfortunately, has uh, been a continuing aspect of human history. Uh, and by the 20th century, when you get powerful nation states uh, with great administrative bureaucratic capacities to mobilize their populations, the capacity of governments to commit mass killing and genocide on hitherto unprecedented scale has increased. Uh, and uh, for me, uh, as a historian, one, I want to understand how we got to where we are today and, in a sense, what are the potentials of the society we live in uh, and the dangers of that. And that one has to understand historically. So understanding the history of genocide and understanding what the aspects of the, the genocide that came out of the society closest to mine. What is the product of Western European civilization, modern European or North Atlantic society, if you will? Uh, the Holocaust becomes, in a sense, the prime example of the most modern society, genocide produced by the society closest to the one that I live in. Uh, so if I want to be an educated citizen, uh, if I want to know both why these things have happened in the recent past and if and how they might happen again, I have to know something about the human behavior that was involved uh, in it. Uh, and uh, so for me, it was it was a sort of a self-evident question, uh, one that uh, when I was first exposed to the Holocaust, reading Raoul Hilberg's massive book back in the late 60s, uh, it's, I just dropped the other topics I was pursuing, and this became what I was going to do my dissertation on. And since then, every bit of research I've done has always raised new questions and new topics that I've continued to pursue. So it's become, in a sense, my, my life scholarly work. Uh, so, uh, as an historian and uh, working with these issues for such a long time, uh, what role do you think Holocaust education can have? Because, you know, there are strong forces. You have been talking about human behavior, social psychology and, and things uh, that we uh, make us human can um, be part of the transform transformation to something very bad. But how can we be a counterpart? Is uh, Holocaust education something that we can use to change the way people will act in different situations. What do you think about that? Yes, I mean, I, th I think in terms of what I'm asked, well, what can one do now? Uh, basically, I say there's both a political answer and an educational answer. 
the political answer is to preserve democratic governments with a culture of human rights, uh, because those are the regimes least likely to commit genocide. One of the lessons of 101, of course, is the regimes that want to commit genocide don't fail to do so for a lack of finding executioners. Regimes that want to commit genocide don't fail because they can't find somebody to do the killing. That's not the, the bottleneck. So the important thing is to make sure that regimes that want to commit genocide don't come about, don't get into power. So preserving democracy and uh, preserving human rights is, is one key thing. The second is education, which is to change people's consciousness, to make them aware that Holocaust killers uh, were not freaks and sadists. Some of them were, but by and large, uh, you don't explain the Holocaust by individual psycho psychopaths, individually psych psychologically abnormal people. Uh, it's not something that only a few other freaks do, but that we normal people would never do. The awareness that normal people like ourselves can be turned into killers is an essential consciousness that needs to be imparted if we're able to have the defenses that enable us not to be mobilized for such things. Uh, I was very gratified when the American military academies uh, for the Air Force, Army, Navy at different times have used ordinary men uh, in their curricula. Uh, and that uh, some police training units in major American cities have used ordinary men. Uh, so that some people have realized that uh, if you, that people particularly in uniform in units where peer pressure group dynamics can become uh, who are armed and, and capable of in fact doing great harm uh, <clears throat> that uh, they will become less susceptible if they are aware ahead of time of the wrong decisions other people in those situations have made been have made uh, so simply a, a raising consciousness making people aware of the vulnerability of normal people like ourselves is part of our self-defense, uh, as part of what prepares us uh, to not be mobilized, to not be uh, recruited for these kinds of activities in the way that so many Germans were in World War II. So um, one last question before I will hand over to Anna, who will uh, 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 we'll uh, start to uh, pick some of the audience questions. Uh, do you see any changes over time on how the history of the Holocaust is used in society? Because you have been working with these uh, issues for such a long time. Do you have any? Yeah. Yeah. I would say there are both the sense the good and the bad. Uh, on, the, on, the, on the unfortunate side, there are those who attempt to politicize the Holocaust at different ends of the political spectrum. Uh, obviously, uh, as Holocaust consciousness increased, neo-Nazis knew that you couldn't whitewash Hitler, you couldn't sell Nazism uh, if people realized how, how central Holocaust and Auschwitz uh, were uh, to the Nazi enterprise. Hitler can't be normalized when you realize how central Auschwitz was to the Nazi history. Uh, so that's when Holocaust denial began to emerge. One, one, one in a sense, uh, response to the expansion of Holocaust denial beginning in the late 1970s uh, was a response to growing Holocaust consciousness and the need, in a sense, to politically neutralize it for fascist neo-Nazi purposes. That's one end of it. Uh, on the other end, of course, we had uh, just about five or six years ago, uh, Benjamin Netanyahu stating uh, to members of the World Jewish Congress coming visiting Israel that it wasn't Hitler, uh, but it was the Grand Mufti of uh, Jerusalem that had suggested the gas chambers. Hitler only wanted to expel the Jews. The man who suggested the final solution uh, was a Palestinian. Uh, that is a gross and horrific misuse of the Holocaust. And fortunately, Virtually every Israeli historian, even at Yad Vashem, which is a state institution, immediately got up and said, no, that is not true. That is nonsense. You can't say that. And the prime minister's office had to quickly rescind that absolutely egregious attempt to misuse the Holocaust for political purposes. Uh, 
So you have people who misuse the Holocaust for political purposes. But on the other hand, you have institutions uh, like the Holocaust Museum in the United States, like Yad Vashem, uh, like the uh, Villa Ten Hampel in Germany uh, and the Vonsei Conference Museum uh, and uh, others who take on a, a job, not only of historical research, but of public education uh, and are trying to uh, raise public consciousness and awareness uh, in a very academically responsible way that is at the same time readily accessible to a broad public. Uh, and that has spread very wide. I mean, I think that's a success story. Uh, the degree to which uh, there's a large number of institutions, and now, of course, even uh, your Forum for Living History in Sweden uh, is an example of, of institutions that have seen it as part of their task uh, to make Holocaust consciousness part of the defense of democracy and part of the defense of human rights and part of the defense against any renewed attempt uh, at atrocity, mass killing, or genocide. Uh, thank you. I just want to say to uh, the people listening that you can write uh, questions in the chat. And uh, I will now hand over to Anna Edman Bastos, who is our international coordinator who will uh, start with some questions. questions. Um, one of the first ones were wondering if there were any reprisals for those who agreed to kill the first time, but then didn't want to continue killing. And, and were there anyone who then actually start, were, were killing in the first place, but then felt like, no, this is not something I can do? Yes, uh, there, th that, uh... Over a period of time, some people on the first day took up the, the major's option, and then over time, others uh, would go to their their officer and say, "I can't do this anymore," uh, and uh, would would be excused from the firing squads as well. So the number of evaders, I think, grew, though we don't know because people who went the other direction don't tell us. Uh, we don't know about particular cases of people who initially didn't shoot and then decided, "Oh, what the heck." Uh, I don't want to be, you know, different than my buddies. I, I'll join the next firing squad. So we have testimonies that are persuasive about people who started shooting and then didn't any longer. Uh, we don't know about traffic in the other direction because that's something people didn't divulge when they were being interrogated. Hmm. The consequences, in fact, were very little. Uh, a few of the men said, well, I was called bad names. Uh, some of my comrades called me a coward or a chicken. Uh, and uh, basically indicated, you know, I wasn't doing my share. I was letting my comrades down. Uh, but uh, certainly there is no disciplinary action because the major had made this policy. Uh, no officer could punish someone uh, of his men if they uh, refused to take part in trigger pulling and the actual act of killing. Uh, so uh, that uh, re reprisals against them uh, certainly not beyond a, a degree of, of social ostracism on the part of, say, the eager killers, who, who I think disparaged the others to some degree, uh, but nothing that uh, would be, we would call drastic, nothing that, uh, that remotely was commensurate with avoiding what uh, they were avoiding. Uh, so, uh, uh, yeah, basically, if you if you opted out, uh, there were no real consequences other than some degree of offices. Okay, thank you. There was also a question regarding if you did in any interviews with with any of the soldiers, or if it was just from from the archives that you got the, the your material from. Yeah, I think we must remember these men. Average age was seven thirty nine and a half in 1942. Yeah, uh, I got into the archives in the late 80s, so they would mm. have been uh, likewise in their late 80s. Mm. But a condition of getting into the archives, the court records, these weren't even in the archives. These were at the, at, then at that point in the uh, prosecuting attorney's office in, in Hamburg. So they were still official judicial records, not in the state archive in Hamburg where they are now. Uh, and the condition for, I had to agree to a number of conditions to get, it took me nine months to get permission to see these. And okay. one of the conditions I had to agree to is that I would not contact any of the men. I would not contact any of the families. I would not use their real names. Uh, mm -hmm. I would not use their addresses. I had to give them total protection of confidentiality. 
-hmm. If I had approached any of these men and tried to interview them and they had complained, I would have lost my capacity to ever see any more German court records. Uh, And of course, they were already in their late 80s. Most of them had already died. Uh, And interviewing people in their late 80s is utterly problematic in any case. Uh, I've interviewed survivors in the late 70s, and that goes fairly well. Once you go 10 years beyond that, it gets very, very difficult. There are very few people in their late 80s that can give a useful interview. So the answer is no. I did not interview any of these people. I was contacted by children or relatives of the next generation by a few of them. So I had some correspondence with families, not of that generation, but of the next generation. Uh, But that's as close as they got, and they had to initiate it. I could not initiate it, but they could. Thank you. Um, There's also a question here that says that when I read your book, um, uh, there was uh, the interest in the issue of remorse among those ordinary men. Alcohol abuse was mentioned, as I recall, but did you identify any um, higher suicide rates, for example, among these men compared to the ordinary population? Yes, when when these men were being interrogated in the 1960s, Mm. uh, they had lived, in a sense, in obscurity for about 20 years after the war, and now suddenly they get a notice from the prosecuting, you know, from the investigators, you have to come in for uh, an interview. Uh, that was very surprising to most of them. They had no idea that they were ever going to face consequences. Uh, and uh, one man uh, interviewed one day when they came to bring him to the interview for the second day, did commit suicide. There was one suicide among all the 210 men uh, who were interviewed. Uh, among the others, uh, there were several reactions. One was that men who hadn't thought about this for 20 years, who had repressed this for 20 years, would say during the interview, coming back the next day after the first opening day, now I'm having nightmares. Being forced to, to re go back and say what had happened bring, brought all this up. They had successfully repressed this, uh, put it out of their minds, and now being forced to testify and talk about it was giving them nightmares. So for some, it was the end of repression and having to confront what they did. Now, the general tenor of most of the men, however, was not remorse, but self-pity. That the general reaction to this was, back in 1942, my country sent me to do a dirty job, and I was left doing the dirtiest job in the Third Reich, And now, 20 years later, they've changed the rules, and they're hauling me into court as a potential criminal and interrogating me and threatening to put me on trial. Poor me. How unlucky can anyone get? No thought of the victim, nothing about the victim at all. It's all about themselves and how unfortunate they have been that they had these two colossal pieces of bad luck in their life, being assigned to a killing unit in 42 and now being investigated judicially in the 1960s. Yeah, that's very interesting. Uh, there's also a question from Facebook that was wondering if there were any response from the Holocaust deniers um, to, to the book. Did they ignore the subject or did they, because they were more focused on the concentration camps? Yeah, the Holocaust deniers have generally focused on Hitler and the lack of a written order for the Holocaust, the final solution. They focused on the death camps and the gas chambers. Uh, And so uh, they haven't focused uh, really on these mobile killing units. Uh, And the way most of them have tried to get around, at least when this has come up in court, I've been in two Holocaust denial trials as an historical expert witness, Aaron Zundel in Toronto in 1988 and David Irving versus Lipstadt in London in 2000. And the general response is to say, well, okay, they were these killings, but this kind of was anti-partisan activities. Uh, It wasn't part of a grand plan to kill all the Jews all over Europe. Uh, It was simply punishing people who were uh, resisting the German occupation. So they they distort it and they twist it and they deny it's being part of a European-wide program for the final solution. Uh, and say, yes, terrible things happen in war. Uh, it happens in Vietnam. It happens uh, in the Balkans. Uh, these kinds of things are natural in war. 
no surprise, and but it doesn't tell us anything at all about uh, the Holocaust. Hmm. Yeah, thank you. There's also a question wondering, <clears throat> were the first line officers and leaders of the battalion also ordinary men or were they hardline Nazis? Um, it's a mix. Uh, the, the major is a professional policeman. Uh, that is, he was a World War I veteran, then went into the police, rose to the ranks, uh, which somebody from his modest background to become a major uh, in the order place was quite a, a meritorious achievement uh, of, of, of a career advancement. Uh, one of the, uh, some, a num most of the lieutenants are reserve police. These are men conscripted in, uh, after the war has started. Uh, they're in their middle age, as in that, that 35 to 45 range. But because they have completed their gymnasium studies or even have uh, gone beyond in some kind of educational training, they were sent to officer training and then come back as reserve lieutenants. Uh, and so that they are not professional police, uh, but they are commissioned reserve lieutenants. After the war, they would have no claim on a police career. They would have to go back to their previous career. The two captains are younger men. They're in their 20s, and they are SS men. These are men who have volunteered for the SS, received SS training. But because they were so mediocre, they don't get good SS assignments. They get the, the lowest prestige SS assignment you can imagine, which is being sent to command a company of middle-aged German old men off the streets of Hamburg. I mean, for an ambitious SS man, this is the worst assignment they could have gotten. Uh, so these were not top SS people. These are not noted SS men. Uh, these were people who had no distinguished career and were and gotten what by the standards of an ambitious SS man was really a very bad assignment. Thank you. Um, then there's a question asking, what was the psychological explanation behind the, the behavior? Uh, for me, it seems that they consider themselves doing a job. Uh, what, what are the connection between what they did and, the, and then also other genocides? And what takeaways can we bring from today's situation um, in Ukraine, for example? And yeah. Uh, situations like that. For when I when I first wrote the book uh, and published in 1992, uh, one of the things I was wanted in the conclusion was, as I said earlier, these were not a group of individuals whose behavior was going to be answered by uh, psychopathology, by individual psychological problems. One had to look at it as a group action, the dynamics of a group, and so one had to look to social psychology. And there, the material we had at the time focused on sort of three key elements of group dynamics. Uh, one was peer pressure, the degree to which being part of a group will shape what people do in order not to be an outsider, not to differ with and challenge the rest of the group, to accept group norms. Uh, second was role adaptation. You put somebody into a position, particularly when you put them in a uniform, uh, and uh, give them a certain professional status, whether it be police or the military, the tendency is to adapt to and to try to fit the expectations of that role. American troops in Vietnam behaved in ways that they never would have done as a civilian in San Diego. Uh, likewise, German police putting on a uniform did not behave the way they would have if they'd still been a restaurant waiter in Hamburg. Uh, they adapt to and try to fulfill the expectations of the role they have been given, the uniform that they are wearing. Uh, and the third is deference to authority, uh, that if you are part of an institution or organization, it's a hierarchy, uh, and uh, that uh, you've accepted membership in that institution, you've also accepted a certain obligation to defer to the authority uh, that is part of that hierarchy. Uh, that was the Milgram experiment. The role expectations was the Philip Zimbardo Stanford experiment. The peer Pressure experiment was by Solomon Ash in the late 50s. So we knew these things. Uh, subsequently, done much more work uh, on, uh, I think, uh, uh, cognitive dissonance. What happens to people uh, when they have a certain a set of moral standards or a certain set of uh, rules that they operate by, and they're placed in a situation where they have to act very differently than the norms they have internalized? 
And the research basically shows uh, that people can't really change the new situation they're in, uh, but they can change and transform their internal norms. And so that men basically alter their moral standards when they're in a position when they can't change the broader situation. Now, if, if you're a secretary and you take a job at an at a office, you discover your boss is embezzling, you can quit or you can you know, rat him out. But if you're drafted into the army, you can't quit. And so the way you resolve cognitive dissonance, which is the clash between your behavior and your moral norms, is to change the one that you have power over. And so you begin to alter your moral norms to remove the cognitive dissonance, remove the clash between these. And that helps to explain why people transform, why they are changed by what they were doing uh, as a result of how they react to cognitive dissonance. Now, Harald Welzer in Germany also talked about how this has turned into a job, turned into a routine. Uh, and then and men basically turned it into an a, a obligation, a piece of work, uh, normalized it in that way. Uh, you don't decide what assignment you're going to get when you're going to do your job, but you do your job. Uh, and you're not morally responsible for the job that you're assigned, uh, other than to do the job well. Uh, that somebody else is responsible for what the job accomplishes, you're responsible for executing this, the task that you've been assigned. Uh, and so these, all of these are parts of, of this social, social psychological explanation of group dynamic that I thought was essential to understanding why 500 relatively ordinary people drafted at random on the street in Hamburg could become an utterly lethal killing unit. Hmm. Thank you. Um, and this was a question. I, I, has, would add, I would add, of yes. course, that that is part of the universal aspect. That is not restricted mm -hmm. to Germany. Uh, mm -hmm. If one is looking at killing units in Rwanda and the genocide, or if one is looking at the capacity of Russian occupation units uh, in Bucha or elsewhere to commit terrible crimes, uh, my guess is that this is part of that dynamic. In fact, in the case of Rwanda, uh, we have a uh, uh, I was a visiting scholar at the American U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum when a psychiatrist from Rwanda was also there. And he was, interesting background, he was half Hutu, half Tutsi. Uh, he had a sister that was in jail as a genocidaire and a sister that had been murdered as a Hutu, uh, as, a, as a Tutsi, I mean. Uh, and so after the genocide, uh, he felt he had to use his psych psychiatric expertise to go into the refugee camps on the Ugandan border and try to deal with the trauma of the survivors. And then he realized in that town, there was also a jail holding a number of the genocidal killers. And this was an opportunity for him, a unique opportunity to actually use his psychiatrical expertise to learn something about this collection of imprisoned killers. He got permission to go into the prison and he issued a survey in which people could report, self-confess their degree of involvement. Now, obviously somebody who are real hardcore killers denied it, but he did get a sufficient number of people who admitted to being fully involved and, and deeply implicated killers. And obviously nobody who wasn't a killer was gonna say that. So he had a, a uncontaminated pool, even if he didn't have everybody, he had a, an uncontaminated pool, gave them a second survey that asked questions about all the kind of motives he could think of. And when it came back, he said he'd never gotten a psychiatric survey response like that, flat line, virtually no correlation with most questions, and then two clusters of questions that just absolutely you know, shot off the baseline uh, into high peaks. One cluster of questions was the ideological side how they justified and framed what they were doing, which was basically the dehumanization of their victims. They were not committing murder because these people were not human beings. A total dehumanization of the victim, they were cockroaches, they were vermin, uh, and that what they were doing was cleansing society. Uh, so what they were doing was not murder. They didn't look upon themselves as murderers. Uh, and they defined their position then from an ideological point of view that the Tutsi were not human beings that deserved to live. Uh, the second was a cluster of questions that dealt with 
how they were held in the, in the eyes of their comrades, issues of self-esteem. Were they admired by their comrades? Were they considered men who had done their share, did more than their share, were exemplary in the fulfillment of their duties in leading the battalion and setting an example for others? So it helped, dealt with this whole issue of uh, their need uh, for acceptance, admiration, uh, uh, praise, uh, and, and recognition from their comrades within the killing unit, which is all this part of the internal dynamics uh, that I had found uh, in, in 101 in terms of peer pressure uh, and, and that sort of thing. So uh, this, what I found in, in, in 101, I found a strange replica in this psychiatrist just results in looking at an utterly different genocide of, of killers in, in the, the Rwandan genocide. So these are more universal aspects, I think, that you would find in killing units in any mass killing operation. Mm. Yeah, interesting. Um, then there was also a question about females, that we'll be talking about the horrors that men have done, but what about yeah. the females? Uh, in this case, uh, two females do make their appearance. Two of the officers, the officers are allowed to have visits from their wives, because this is in Poland in 42, so you're well behind the actual fighting lines deep in Russia. Uh, and one of the captains and one of the lieutenants are visited by their wives. Uh, and their reactions are utterly different. Uh, the, cap the SS captain's wife goes with him on a ghetto clearing action, is standing there on the plaza as people are rounded up and driven to the trains in the single most ferocious, lethal ghetto clearing. To put 10,000 people on the train in Mianzirchich, they shot 1,000 people. One out of every 11 people had to be killed just to get them into the train cars. And she's sitting there watching this all day uh, uh, with her new husband. Uh, well, he's in. Well, he's commanding a major part of it, uh, and so uh, this was just you know clearly someone who identified with and admired her husband, and and later in court, of course, denied all of this. The other wife uh, was uh, was upset by what she was seeing out there. Uh, was a very cooperative witness with the with the police interrogations twenty years later, uh, and so we have two utterly different reactions by the two wives that we knew visited. Uh, one of, of approval and one uh, who was shocked and, and dismayed by what she saw. Uh, now, some, many Einsatz group and, and others, in fact, had female secretaries and, and some people on the staff that traveled with the killing unit. I don't know that there was, I don't, think, I don't know that there was any female on the staff of 101. So I don't know that we have any other uh, members of the battalion that were actually female. We do know that they had female visitors. Okay, thank you. Um, <clears throat> and then there's a question, how many in Germany knew about the atrocities and why did they not protest? Uh, when we say knew, of course, the question is, how much did they know and, and what kind of details do they know? Mm -hmm. Everybody in Germany knew in the 30s that the Jews were being prosecuted, persecuted, deprived of their rights. This was all public law. Uh, the laws that drove them out of the civil service, the laws that banned, Nuremberg laws that banned sex and intermarriage, uh, the great pogrom of 1938, they burned down every synagogue in Germany, that was no secret. Uh, the closing of Jewish businesses uh, was no secret. So the persecution of the Jews is totally public. And of course, the various Nazi speakers are bragging about this as an accomplishment of the regime. Uh, we know that a fair people knew about the deportations because even before they took place, people lined up at the housing authority to get in line to get a Jewish apartment. So rumors of this had spread widely even before Jews were deported from this city or that city. Uh, now, we also know, of course, that soldiers back on leave uh, uh, and, and spread, you know, talked about what they had seen and what they had done. So uh, rumors and not just rumors, but firsthand information about the massacres on the Eastern Front spread fairly widely in Germany, were fairly well known, even if people didn't connect the dots and know that it was part of an overall plan to kill every Jew in Europe, people knew that large numbers of people, and in particular Jews, were being killed 
uh, by the thousands uh, by firing squad in the Soviet Union. They knew that the Jews being deported out of Germany were never going to come back. Uh, what was going to happen to them was, uh, you know, you didn't, you didn't ask. You knew it wasn't going to be good for their health. But the notion that, I remember the, the, the profile of the Jewish population in Germany by 1941 is overwhelmingly elderly and female. Now, the notion that these were people being sent to the East to work uh, and to, you know, in labor camps and on farms isn't very persuasive. Uh, and so people either chose not to ask uh, or chose to realize uh, these people will be sent off. The living conditions aren't going to be great. And one thing we know is that they're never coming back. They're never going to reclaim their property. Uh, if I buy their dishes at this auction or I get a hold of their apartment, uh, I'm going to have it and no one is going to take it away again. Hmm. Now, where they don't know details is that uh, the details of gas chambers and death camps. That is much more limited. There were allied broadcasts that talked about this. Uh, over the period, uh, over 42 to 44. But of course, that could be dismissed as, as atrocity propaganda like World War I. Uh, and so not nearly the same type of uh, eyewitness accounts of what's happening on the Eastern Front. The advantage to the Germans, the death camps, is how few people are actually present for the mass murder. Uh, many people needed to set them, to round people up and to deport them. Very few people for the killing. Uh, camp Treblinka, for instance. Here's a camp where 950,000 people are murdered in 12 months, and it required 800 Jewish workers, who you're going to kill at the end, 120 auxiliary police or auxiliary guards recruited from prisoners of war, Ukrainians like Ivan Demnyanyuk, and 30 SS men. Uh, well, 30 SS men uh, aren't going to spread too many rumors in Germany. Uh, so you don't get the knowledge of the death camps, anything like you have knowledge of the mass shootings that would have allowed them to connect the dots. I mean, if you're building gas chambers, this isn't for the occasional rogue action or it isn't part of a uh, repression of partisans or simply what happens in war. That's part of a design to kill every Jew in Europe of every Jew that's deported. Uh, so uh, as, as one of my colleagues said, uh, the Germans knew enough to know they didn't want to know anymore. So you didn't ask questions about what happened to the deportees, because if you got the answer, you knew that it would put you in the quandary where you had to say, why didn't I do anything? Why didn't I protect my neighbor? So willed ignorance becomes a key line of psychological defense during the war. Uh, and uh, not just after the war, but even during the war, choosing not to know what you could have known. Yeah. Yes, and if we bring it back to to today's, how could how can we educate ourselves then to not get accustomed to doing things we initially would not choose to do? It's a tricky uh, question, but uh, yeah. Well, uh, first of all, I think we have to be aware, and certainly this is what part of Holocaust, Holocaust education about is how incremental this is. It doesn't just happen on one day. Mm. Uh, you start by depriving Jews of their civil rights in 1933. You deprive them of their social rights, the right to intermarry and to socialize with others in 1935 with the Nuremberg Laws. You deprive them of their property in 1938, and you deprive them of freedom of movement over 38 to 41. By the time Jews are put on the trains in Germany, most of them have not talked to a German or interacted with a German uh, for a number of years. Most of them, in fact, have had to leave their previous homes. They're not with their neighbors anymore. They've moved into so-called Judenhäuser or Jew houses. Uh, so they've been isolated. So the isolation of the victim through a set, series of incremental acts that deprive them of all their rights, isolate them from the rest of society, makes them then vulnerable to deportation and killing because you really severed them from the rest of society. Uh, so simply understanding uh, how this is done incrementally and what steps are, are necessary along the way is part of what Holocaust education has to be about. Uh, you don't simply one day put people in gas chambers. Uh, it is going to take a, a series of preparatory measures uh, that have to serve as warning signals. Uh, and uh, to realize what those warning signals are, realize 
not what, what inevitably is going to happen, but what could happen, what a potential uh, is there if you begin a process of depriving a, a group, a minority in society of its rights, of its social connections, of its property, uh, of its freedom of movement, where this is going to, where this can lead to, uh, is all part, I think, essential of, uh, of, uh, of Holocaust education. Thank you. Um, did Caroline have any questions that you wanted to follow up to? Connecting to, to this last question about, you were talking about warning signals and uh, I think uh, that's one of the, the things about understanding why, did, how could the Holocaust happen and how did it go about, but uh, what do you say about today um we have uh, we have a lot of changes in society uh, uh, the social media is is spreading a lot of um maybe fake news and and uh, distortion of the holocaust and so forth how is it influencing our understanding of these important matters um I guess I'm not quite sure of this question. Can you? Can you? Yeah, I, I think um, um, in today's society, when we have the social media, a lot of young young people they uh, they inter um, interact with the maybe fake news about the Holocaust and uh, distortion about the history and and so forth. Uh, so, do you see it has um, changed anything in how we need to approach uh, Holocaust education or things like that? Yeah, that, uh, I guess there I would say I'm showing my age because, you know, uh, I'm not social media savvy. I don't have <laughs> these various accounts. Uh, I would say uh, that uh, certainly in terms of say Holocaust denial, in the 80s and 90s, uh, it went under the guise of kind of a pseudo academic enterprise. That is, they behaved and posed as historians, as experts, and they were pseudo historians, they were fake, they were writing fake history, posing as real history. They wanted the authority and legitimacy of being the other interpretation, the rival historical interpretation. They used the term that we're revisionist historians, and of course all history is revisionist. So they were trying to get a legitimacy, they were trying to get academic legitimacy. Now that failed, and particularly when when David Irving, who had been a well-published, you know, freelance historian, lost in his in his suit to Deborah Lipstadt and was totally discredited, that twenty-year campaign of Holocaust denial through academic legitimacy basically crashed and burned. But that's of course exactly when the internet was coming, and so now uh, Holocaust denial has shifted to a much cruder kind of appeal. Uh, and uh, to do so through social media. And what we're getting now is not only, in a sense, sort of two tracks. You not only have on the, on, the, on the internet the false history or the denial of the Holocaust, but you're also simultaneously uh, getting Holocaust approval. I mean, if you look at, 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 the, at the crowd in January 6th riot that uh, took over the U.S. Capitol, after in, in, 19, in 2020. Some of these guys were wearing sweatshirts that said Camp Auschwitz. Uh, and some of them were wearing some that said, I think it was, uh, if I'm, I'm going to get it right, uh, 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 6MNE, 6 million not enough. Uh, so these are people who aren't denying the Holocaust. Uh, they're approving the Holocaust. They're embracing the Holocaust. So part of white nationalism of this next, uh, and white supremacy is not trying to deny the Holocaust anymore, uh, but to in fact now embrace it. Uh, the problem was the didn't, job didn't get finished and, and do that openly. And says the shamelessness of Holocaust, uh, of, of white supremacy is now gone beyond Holocaust denial to in some cases, even Holocaust embrace or Holocaust approval. And that's a new development. Uh, and, uh, uh, but I think we have to realize that in the, in the current climate, uh, behave, taboos have been broken. 
Uh, and there are certain behaviors now that wouldn't have happened 20 years ago that now people can wear T-shirts or, or sweatshirts with emblems that that boast of uh, of uh, being pro-Nazi, white supremacist, and uh, approving of the Holocaust. Thank you. We have quite a few different questions about Ukraine now and the, the war happening. Is there anything mm -hmm. that you want to that we can relate back to to what happened then to what happened now? Is there any well, comments you would like to make in what happening well, in Ukraine? Well, certainly, the certainly there, of course, for, for for Europeans and Americans, the analogy is not so much the Holocaust, but Germany in the interwar period, mm -hmm. uh, where a country uh, that felt it had a great grievance, in this case, where Germany was defeated in World War I in the Versailles Treaty, uh, for Russia, it's the dissolution of the Soviet Union and the fall from great power status. Other than nuclear weapons, Russia is... Uh, you know, has an economy smaller than the state of California. Uh, uh, it's not a economic great power. It's a petro dictatorship with nuclear weapons. Uh, and uh, so the grievance that we have been cheated out of our historical greatness uh, and that we need to undo that. And the way to undo that is to gain back lost territories uh, as a as a eerie similarity to, of course, the rhetoric of the Nazis in the 30s and Putin before the invasion of the Ukraine. Uh, the denigration of their opponent is not a real country. Poland recreated in 1919, the Ukraine created uh, after the dissolution of the Soviet Union, not being legitimate. Uh, these are made up countries uh, and they really belong to and have been taken away from Germany or, or, or the Ukraine. So our, our parallel there really is, I think, much more the issue of aggression uh, and uh, Lebensraum, to use the Nazi term, uh, to the restoration of the greatness of the Soviet Union in Putin's own mind uh, are, are, the, are the striking parallels. Uh, and of course, long before the Holocaust, what the Germans did in Poland, uh, is was by the standards of 1939 utterly shocking. I mean, the mass murder and the atrocities that were committed. Uh, looking back, we can see how this is a prelude to and foreshadows what happens in 41. By the standards of 1939, this was already shocking. What the, what the Russians did in Bucha and have done elsewhere uh, are in a sense equivalent in many ways to uh, what the Nazis did when they invaded uh, Poland in 1939. Uh, no respect for civilian life. Uh, you're making war not only on a country, but on the civilians as well. Uh, and that I think those are the real parallels that we that we can see at the moment. Thank you. And thank you so much for everyone asking all the questions. And we're sorry that we didn't have time to ask them all. Um, thank you so much, Professor Browning. I'm going to hand you back to Caroline now. So thank you, Professor, uh, for sharing your great knowledge and uh, your long experience with us. Uh, and uh, tomorrow it's uh, the Holocaust Memorial Day and we will have, uh, as Petra said, a lot of more activities that uh, you can participate uh, in. Um, for example, by uh, joining on uh, the Swedish television, uh, tomorrow you can can see a ceremony from Erik Eriksson Hallen where we are going to um, to have a remembrance ceremony and thank you very much professor the time is uh, going fast when you have such an interesting guest uh, i hope we will have uh, some opportunity to talk you with you again so thank you thank you